Good morning. Um, I have nothing to declare. So in a typical fMRI experiment, we're going to administer some type of stimulus to our participant or assume that there's some undergo underlying stimulus in the resting state. That this activity, uh, in, in neuronal activity, is going to be somehow coupled to a local vascular response. Um, and this vascular or hemodynamic response is what we can then detect with an fMRI sequen sequence as described eloquently in the previous talk. So our stimulus is going to have some um, paradigm timing. This is an example of a block design. And as we'll hear later in the sessions, um, you then model what you think this hemodynamic response is going to be, and you look for any signals that uh, appear like that paradigm in your fMRI data. However, it's really important that we always keep in mind that the fMRI signals are never a direct measure of that neuronal activity, at least in a typical acquisition. And we need to understand this coupling between neuronal activity and this hemodynamic response in order to interpret what a, a bold fMRI signal means. So as an overview, I'll introduce blood oxygenation and how this influences susceptibility. Um, mo most importantly, for functional imaging, how do changes in this bold signal um, manifest via neurovascular regulation um, and how we can uh, model this through the hemodynamic response function. There are many non-neuronal things that can also contribute to what we see as the bold signal, um, and so these confounds need to be understood, um, mediated, or removed in post-processing. And then finally, um, if we want to take bold fMRI with all of these caveats, if we want to take that and make it useful in, in different patient cohorts, are there things we can do to make it more quantitative, make it more precise um, at measuring one parameter? So first, what is the role of human blood? Um, well, primarily it needs to transport oxygen to the tissue. Uh, it needs to then move carbon dioxide and other waste products away from the tissue. It shuttles other nutrients like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, hormones, and enzymes. And in addition to all of this transport, it acts kind of like a buffer. It can regulate body temperature. It can control local pH and regulate electrolytes. And the anatomy of the vasculature has evolved to become very efficient at doing all of these jobs. Um, so you see here a sagittal view um, of a time of flight angio, and you see large vessels coming up, entering the brain. They, they meet at the circle of Willis to form some collateral flow options, and then these larger arteries kind of move from around circling the brain and then eventually penetrate into the cortex to reach the tissue. At that point, we see this type of structure, which we refer to as the vascular tree. Um, blood comes in through the large arteries, the type you might see in your angiogram. Uh, they then begin to branch into smaller and smaller vessels, uh, which we generally consider and name as arterioles. Uh, again, with more branching, we reach the smallest vessels, the capillaries, and it's at this capillary bed that you get the exchange of oxygen and nutrients with the tissue. These small vessels then anastomose into small venules, which then combine into large veins, which eventually drain out of the system. And just to give you a visual of what this uh, is in, in the human, this is a cast of the vessels in the occipital cortex. You see uh, larger arteries, you see these penetrating vessels going perpendicular into the cortex, and you see the start of what would be the capillary bed here. So within this architecture, you have moving blood. And what, what comprises this blood? Well, m over half of it is basically water. Uh, so the plasma is uh, over 90% water. And this is most of your buffering action, so temperature, pH, and electrolyte uh, regulation. There is a, a tiny fraction here. Uh, one or 2% of the blood is made up of white blood cells and platelets. Uh, these are very interesting, important molecules. They, they're influencing uh, blood clotting and immune responses, but it is a very small fraction. And for our purposes, we're interested in this fraction here. About 45% of the blood is, is red blood cells or erythrocytes. And you can think of these as sacs of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the main um, metalloprotein that's going to be carrying the oxygen in the blood. So in one microliter of human blood, there are millions of these red blood cells. Um, and this exact amount uh, can vary from person to person. It varies with gender, with race, with uh, whatever altitude you've gotten acclimatized to. Um, and overall, this system of red blood cells and plasma, it allows for less viscous blood that can move through the, the plumbing of the architecture. Um, it allows for higher concentrations of oxygen to be carried because of this hemoglobin. <clears throat> 
So hemoglobin, as we've already touched on in the previous talk, um, this is really the, the source of the MRI bold contrast. So I said that there were millions of red blood cells in a microliter of blood, where there's hundreds of millions of hemoglobin molecules in a red blood cell. Um, and hemoglobin is particularly good at carrying oxygen. It has a high affinity for it, and it carries 98% of the oxygen in your blood. There's a little bit that's kept in the plasma, but hemoglobin really is the main workhorse here. And in terms of magnetic properties, um, this uh, molecule contains a heme, which is basically iron. Collectively, all of your blood in the body, you're only talking about a couple of grams of iron in an adult male, um, but being strongly paramagnetic, these heme groups are like little bar magnets floating through your vasculature, and they're going to disrupt signal. So perhaps the, the, the key linchpin of all of bold contrast is that once you start putting oxygen onto this molecule, we effectively shield these heme groups, uh, and the molecule as a whole becomes diamagnetic instead of paramagnetic. And this results in different dephasing of nearby tissues. So um, when you have oxygenated blood, you will see one decay of your MRI signal. When it's deoxygenated and you start to have those heme groups exposed, it causes additional dephasing, and so you'll have a faster decay of that signal. And we generally look at this in terms of R2 star. So the exact relationship between blood oxygenation and R2 star dephasing um, has been extensively modeled. Uh, the simplest thing you can do is look at a single vessel and model it as a, a long, infinite uh, cylinder. And you look at the dephasing of spins that are diffusing around that cylinder. So here's an example of a large vessel, and you can consider this a, a voxel of tissue surrounding it. And we're looking at the vessel in cross-section. And you can see the changes in magnetic field around the vessel caused by the deoxyhemoglobin present within. So at time equals zero, yes, all of your spins are aligned. Um, but as time passes, you start to see dephasing um, due to these uh, local inhomogeneities in field. And exactly what this dephasing is, it's going to depend on many properties of the vessel, including things like orientation and radius. Um, so for a single vessel, we might be able to, to measure this and include it in a model. But when we want to look at bold fMRI, we really want to look at the capillary bed, where we don't necessarily have the ability to look at the microvascular architecture in this way. So in a seminal paper by Yablonski and Heike, we, we look at the capillary bed modeled as many of these cylinders um, that are randomly oriented within a voxel. And you have to make certain assumptions. You have to assume that the blood volume overall is quite small, um, a relationship where the, the vessels are much longer and straighter than the distance between them. Um, but if you, if you take these assumptions, you can model the relaxation of R2 prime um, in this way. So you have the total blood volume, and then you have a, an aspect to do with the susceptibility difference. And this is going to involve the hematocrit, so how many red blood cells, how many hemoglobin molecules are there um, in, in your blood, and then the oxygenation status of those hemoglobin molecules. So that's how we get a baseline bold related signal. Um, but what about functional changes in this value? So the vasculature is constantly regulating itself. Blood flow is constantly fluctuating. And this is primarily to maintain oxygen supply to the tissue. Uh, the brain drives most of its energy from oxidative metabolism of glucose. Um, and you need six oxygen molecules for every glucose molecules. And the key thing is that there really is no mechanism for storing this oxygen locally in the brain next to the tissue that needs it. You need to have the blood constantly delivering it. So if blood flow is ceased, um, I read somewhere on an unreputable source online um, that neuronal function could only last for a matter of seconds. Um, so if you have any changes, any increases in oxidative metabolism, uh, then you really need to provide it with extra delivery of blood and oxygen to that area. To do this, um, we have evolved to have this very complex system of cells that surround the blood vessels and help regulate their diameter. If you change the diameter of the vessel, you can change how much blood is flowing through it. So we have neurons and interneurons that are nearby. Um, the, this red blood vessel here is surrounded by endothelium cells. This forms the vessel wall uh, and part of the blood-brain barrier, and it can produce vasoactive agents on its own. Um, but really, we want to pay attention to these smooth muscle cells or myocytes. Uh, being muscles, if they relax, it allows the vessel to dilate. And if they contract, it causes the vessel to constrict. And these are, are generally regulated by waves in, in calcium ions. Astrocytes, um, illustrated as these green cells, are very plentiful cells. They can sense neurotransmitters, and they, they um, can synapse on uh, neuronal synapses. 
And they also have end feet that surround our blood vessels and create the perivascular space and part of the blood-brain barrier. And they can communicate long distances with each other and propagate calcium waves uh, to the smooth muscle. And then finally, an exciting area of research is in exploring the role of the parasite. These are smaller cells that support smaller vessels, um, generally at the capillary level, and they can directly influence vessel tone. So it's important to know that these cells are not necessarily the same across the whole brain. There's not one normal type of astrocyte, for example. Uh, exactly how these cells function, the relative ratios of these cells, is going to vary uh, from brain region to brain region and from person to person. But ultimately, it's a very complex orchestration of factors that results in vasodilation or constriction. So, Ultimately, what we see, though, is that for a given increase in metabolism, the increase in blood flow is much larger. It's generally about twice as big as what would be necessary, and this is called functional hyperemia. Um, so, so really, why? Why is this taking place? We have this very complex orchestration of many cell types, and they are ultimately giving us more blood than we might think we need based on the oxygen demand of the tissue. And the current hypothesis is that you actually need to do this if you want to get oxygen to the tissue furthest away from the vessels. Um, that oxygen transport, that's just diffusion. Uh, and it depends on the gradient of oxygen from you know, going from A to B. So if you want to increase how much oxygen is arriving at the tissue, you can do two things. You can reduce the distance from the vessel where the oxygen is to the tissue that needs it. Um, and this might be done through the process of capillary recruitment, where new vessels start to have blood flowing through them that didn't otherwise have it. Um, but primarily, the way to get more oxygen to the tissue is to pump the capillary bed full of additional oxygen. Um, so you can see here uh, a plot of the flow change, CBF, cerebral blood flow change, um, compared to the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, or oxygen metabolism change. And if it really was a one-to-one -one relationship, we'd be down here at this dashed line. But oxygen transport models, considering the diffusion effects, um, put us up at this red line here. And the dots are empirical data. So we are, we are looking at this area where flow exceeds uh, the demand. So this translates into bold activation. Uh, so here we have a schematic uh, at baseline. You have uh, blood coming in on the arterial side, fully oxygenated. And on the venous side, because these cells have extracted oxygen, uh, we end up with deoxyhemoglobin on the venous side of the vascular tree. What happens during activation? Well, we, we have cells that need more oxygen. They're trying to, to remove more from the environment. If we had an insufficient flow increase, uh, then we would have that increase in oxygen metabolism would result in greater deoxyhemoglobin on the venous side. And as we've heard already, that will result in a negative bold signal change due to that dephasing effect. However, with functional hyperemia, the blood flow far exceeds um, what is required. And so on the venous side, we end up with excess oxygen um, compared to the baseline state. And this results in a positive bold effect. So as I said, we are generally working in this range here where the coupling between flow and metabolism um, uh, results in a, a positive bold signal. And this gives us bold activation. And you can model these functional changes in bold activation. Um, perhaps the most famous is the Davis model, uh, where R2 star is modeled as a scaling constant um, uh, pro uh, as a product with blood volume. And the deoxyhemoglobin concentration raised to this exponential power beta. And that's kind of an empirical exponent uh, linked to, to vessel radius factors. And if you look at the change in signal um, related to changes in R2 star, and you make some approximations in a Taylor expansion, then you can model a change in your signal as a scaling factor and this relationship here of the change in volume and the change in deoxyhemoglobin. Now, on the previous slide, I've just shown you that deoxyhemoglobin is, on the venous side, is dependent on this relationship of flow and metabolism. So we can rewrite this in this way, where instead of looking at the change in deoxyhemoglobin, we're looking at a change in the relationship of metabolism and flow. And then finally, if you make an assumption uh, to do with uh, how much of a flow change do you get in a vessel due to a change in blood volume, then we can simplify this even further. So our bold signal change is a scaling factor, and then this to do with blood flow and metabolism. And I'll come back to this later. <laughs> 
But this model, um, it's, it's sort of medium complexity. Uh, people have made it much more complex and detailed to do with different signal compartments within a voxel. People have simplified it, trying to just get it to its bare bones of what's necessary uh, in order to understand the bold signal a little bit better. And you'll see a lot of ongoing research in this area at the conference. Uh, so that model well explains more steady state changes, but what about functional changes? Um, in general, uh, when we do an fMRI experiment, we convolve our stimulus model with this hemodynamic response function, um, which tries to emulate the response of the vasculature to a very brief neuronal stimulus. And typically, we model it as the sum of two gamma functions, which allows this very flexible shape. There's a bit of a delay because the vascular response is a bit sluggish. It's a bit broad because the response is, again, a, a blurring and smoothing in, in terms of the temporal uh, evolution. And there may or may not be some interesting properties like an undershoot um, after the main bold effect. And this is because those changing relationships of flow, metabolism, and volume don't necessarily have the same time course as each other um, in different brain regions. However, this hemodynamic response function, although your typical fMRI software package will allow you to tick a box that says, please convolve with an HRF, um, it's actually quite a bit more complicated and more variable than that. So here we see typical HRFs um, for each uh, plot is a different subject, and each line is a different brain region. And the black line is sort of showing the canonical HRF for reference. And you see a great deal of variability um, in, in how different individuals and different brain regions uh, might respond to an impulse of neural activity in terms of the vasculature. Looking at this variability a little bit further, um, if the blood changes have to travel a longer vascular path to reach the tissue, then an impulse in uh, blood response might get blurred. So this is simulating a delay in transit time also looks uh, to increase and broaden the impulse response function. So here in one individual, we see bold activation in the visual cortex. But plotting the time to peak of the hemodynamic response function and the full width have maximum of the hemodynamic response function, you see that these vary by several seconds, even within one functional region of one individual. And this variation might be very important depending on your study. And then a lot of these processes are going to be affected by pathology. Um, so here's just one example. It's a, an uh, a mouse study, uh, not fMRI, um, but it is looking at changes in blood oxygenation. And on the top, you have wild-type mice, and on the bottom, um, it's, uh, they have some degeneration of their parasites. And remember, those are cells that make up part of the neurovascular unit for vascular regulation. And what we see on the top is the normal response to a neural stimulus, and that's shown in red here. And on uh, the bottom, you see the impaired um, response due to parasite degeneration. And it's delayed and reduced compared to the wild-type animals. Now, we know parasites might be degenerated in ApoE4 carriers. ApoE4 might be related to Alzheimer's. So ultimately, what you have to ask is if you see a change in your bold response, in the hemodynamic response function, or in some task-based uh, study that you're doing, would you ascribe that difference to a neural impairment or a vascular impairment. And it's very difficult with just bold fMRI to really make this differentiation. So I'll just pause and ask a couple of questions for you to mull over. And I warn you now, there's not exactly a right answer to any of them. So is the vascular architecture comparable across my patient cohorts? What do I do about that? Do individuals have different hematocrits? Am I measuring that? Are there any pathological changes to cells in the neurovascular unit that are going to influence perhaps neurovascular coupling? Can I just assume the canonical HRF in my analysis? Should it be patient-specific? Should it be brain region-specific? Should it be voxel-specific? And how do you account for different temporal shifts between your stimulus model and your data that account for this vascular latency? So now that I've left you with a lot of questions, I'll just carry on. Um, <laughs> So there are many things that can influence the bold signal that are not necessarily driven by that neuronal activity we're interested in. And it's really important to understand these confounds. So we've already heard a little bit about the fact that 
we're talking about bold contrast in terms of changes in R2 star, um, but our signal is going to be directly influenced by changes in, in S0 as well. And as already described, head motion is a key culprit here. So here's a plot um, from, from Jonathan Power showing uh, displacement in terms of millimeters on the top row. And this plot here, every row is a different voxel in the data set, um, and the bold signal is represented in grayscale. And you see after these head movement artifacts, you see a lot of signal dephasing. And so that's generally through S0 effects, and you might want to consider changing your acquisition, doing something multi-echo, or working very hard in, in post-processing um, to remove some of these effects, and really look at the R2 star changes that we think are linked to true blood oxygenation effects. We also know that arterial blood gases can directly influence the bold signal irrespective of the oxygen metabolism. So here we, we see that resting fluctuations in carbon dioxide levels, uh, CO2 is a, a potent vasodilator, um, and you will see these resting fluctuations in CO2 just caused by changes in your breathing are going to manifest in your bold signal. And you can amplify this. Um, here's a study with uh, a series of breath holds during an experiment, and you see a large increase in CO2, which dominates your bold time series. And if you think, if you have a particularly difficult stimulus, your participant might hold their breath for a, a, just a second or two when they're thinking very hard, working memory or something. And are you accounting for what this might be doing to your bold signal? Autoregulation is another process by which your vessels um, regulate uh, their diameter in response to changes in blood pressure. Um, this keeps us, despite fluctuations in blood pressure, it prevents hemorrhage and ischemia. And here's just an example of a thigh cuff relief study um, where we see this big dip in mean arterial pressure, and you can see that in the bold time series. So any changes in blood pressure might again be confounding your bold data. It's non-neuronal, but it is going to be there. And uh, in case I haven't scared you enough, pretty much everything can influence blood flow, changes in blood flow, and thus the bold contrast. So this is a wonderful and slightly terrifying um, uh, figure from a, a paper that's just coming out now, showing all of the, the different things that can influence blood flow. So in blue, you have negative changes in flow, and it goes all the way around, minimal effect. To over here, red, you have increases in, in, in blood flow. And in case you can't read it, let's see, we have everything from alcohol, age, drug use, hematocrit, sleep levels, caffeine, whether or not your eyes are open, uh, gender, um, physical exercise, mood, and heart rate. So, so pretty much everything that might be experienced by a human being is going to influence your physiology. And this is a friendly reminder that you should try to minimize that variation and try to measure how much it might be affecting your data. So again, some more questions to leave you with. How well have you characterized R2 star, and how, much have, uh, how certain are you you've separated that from any other uh, S0 effects? Are your participants changing their breathing or blood pressure during your stimulus? Is there a way for you to measure that during scan scanning with a, a nasal cannula, with a blood pressure cuff, et cetera? Could hypertension, atherosclerosis, or other physiological factors impact coupling? Is your participant, have they taken any medications? Are they under anesthesia? Did you accidentally let them have a cup of coffee before you put them in the scanner? So finally, this is all, um, th that was all the worrying side, but what can we do about it? How can we try to make bold fMRI more precise and linked to neural activity? How can we make it more quantitative? So the first thing I would argue is that we should really test for differences in the cerebrovasculature. You can look at the architecture with angiography. You can measure baseline perfusion with things like ASL. These are very standard sequences now. Um, I would also recommend you look at vascular responsiveness, not just how much blood is flowing through a baseline, but how well can that neurovascular unit respond and increase blood flow. One way to do that is to administer carbon dioxide to a person during scanning. That could be a breath hold or gas inhalation. But this lets you make maps of cerebrovascular reactivity. So what bold change do you get um, based on a CO2 change? And this gives you a sense of uh, functional health of the vasculature. And you can also map latencies with arterial transit times um, using ASL or, or contrast methods. <laughs> 
A lot of this is going to involve collecting complementary data. So on the left, uh, you can collect baseline perfusion using arterial spin labeling. Uh, this is from the white paper, um, just showing uh, what you, you can easily map quantitative blood flow in the whole brain as part of your scanning repertoire. But you could also look at this functionally. You can look for changes in blood flow using slightly modified ASL techniques. And you can also measure blood volume using vascular space occupancy, or VASO. And here you see a functional study where the bold activation is here, and then you see a change in the blood volume as measured with VASO here. And that these, both of these techniques have really come a long way and are becoming more mainstream. You'll see at this meeting that there are people who are trying to combine everything. So you get bold, uh, you get CBF, and you get blood volume in one acquisition. And when you start doing that, you can start looking at calibrating your, your bold signal. So if we go back to that uh, Davis model, um, remember we have here the bold signal. Um, we have here something to do with a flow change, which we can measure using ASL simultaneously. We can estimate the scaling constant just by giving a CO2 challenge. And then by putting this all together, we can model a change in oxygen metabolism. And this, we hope, is what's actually going to be more closely linked to neural activity. Uh, there's also the quantitative bold effect, or Q-bold, um, and this uh, requires a different type of acquisition and is less functional. It's more of a, a baseline measure, um, but this is also uh, being used by, by numerous groups. And if you do this, you begin to rescale your idea of, of activation in an fMRI data set. So here's an example from an elderly cohort. If you look at the bold response between young in light gray and old in black, there really wasn't much difference in terms of the bold signal, nothing significant. If you look at resting blood flow, though, you see a trend. The older volunteers have reduced perfusion. If you look at the responsiveness of the vessels using carbon dioxide, you see a substantial and significant reduction in responsiveness in the older cohort. So when you put this together with a model, you actually see indications that perhaps for the same stimulus, the older subjects have increased changes in uh, oxygen metabolism. Those cells might be working harder. And you can see that with calibration, and you can't really see that from the original bold data. And you might also relocate your activation. So here's a, a layer study um, where we see uh, the bold response um, as a function of cortical depth. So on the left, at, at zero, you have the boundary of CSF and gray matter, and then you're moving more deeply towards white matter. And you see it peaks relatively close to the surface of gray matter. But if you calibrate this, and you're no longer looking at bold, but you're looking at metabolic changes, then you see that this gets pushed a bit deeper into the cortex. So just to summarize, Bold fMRI is incredibly powerful, um, but it is incredibly complicated. And it's important that we always remember uh, throughout our data collection, our analysis and interpretation, that bold is never a direct measure of neuronal activity. Um, if you want to use fMRI in patient studies, if you want to make quantitative assessments of different cohorts, you really need to understand the neurovasculature of those cohorts. You can collect complementary data to try to look at this better. You can collect perfusion and blood volume and try to use models to make everything more quantitative and more precise. But if this all sounds like, um, like negativity, it's actually not. You can view this on the entire other direction. You could see the complexity of the bold signal as a challenge, but as an opportunity. Because it's sensitive to so many things, if you're clever, you can use bold fMRI to look at a lot more than just activation blobs. You can use it to look at neurovascular health and function. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>